We're all together. It is 7.30 by my clock, so I would like to call this meeting to order. Um, we've already done a roll call um, at the open session prior to closed session. Um, board went into closed session at um, 7.02, emerged at 7.23, no reportable actions. The, the uh, negotiator did receive instruction from the board. Okay. Um, open session agenda. Let's see. So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this month's meeting and I will read the usual rules. This will be a virtual meeting of the Maroonwood CSD Board of Directors pursuant to Executive Order N2920 issued by the Governor of the State of California. It will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information that is printed on this agenda. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting either via internet or telephone shall indicate their desire to speak. The participating via internet, please click on the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Okay. I'd like to ask the board if there are any changes or deletions from tonight's agenda. I would like to add something, if it's possible. Uh, Eric? I, think you, I think you can delete and you can change the order, but I'm not sure you can add anything. Okay. It would have to be an emergency something. Um, well, because there's nothing on the agenda about voting new officers. Well, I can cover that really quickly. Um, that doesn't happen until the December meeting, okay. and uh, it's good that you bring this up, Bill, because you are the current vice president, and since uh, our current president will no longer be part of the board for the next meeting, guess who gets to chair the next meeting? Lovely. <laughs> yep, the vice Thank president. Thank you. That's what Mr. I was chair. curious about. Yep. yep. I couldn't it's remember you. all these years that I've been on the board when this happens. No, it happens in December in accordance with the bylaws. Okay. So it'll be on the next agenda. Thank you. Yep. Any other board members have any changes or deletions from my agenda? Uh, Jeff, if I could just point out, as was uh, graciously pointed out to me, I have a little bit of a numbering error in the agenda where it goes from A, B, C, D, and then back to C, and then jumps to E. So uh, the numbering is a little off but I think we know where we're at. We've mastered the alphabet by now, I think. So <laughs> we'll be good. Obviously, I haven't, so I apologize for any confusion. Okay. Um, all right. If there are no changes to tonight's agenda, I will move that it or I will say that it is adopted as presented. And we will move to testing. Item C2, consent calendar. Does anyone have anyone on the board have any questions about the uh, meeting minutes of the October 13th or the closed or special November 5th meeting or the bills paid? Nope. Leo, you're not shaking your head. I guess nobody on the board has any questions about any of those. I do not. Okay, I've, ha I've asked several of the uh, district manager and I have received my answers and I'm totally satisfied with what I saw. So, um, I'd like to move to adopt the consent calendar as presented. A second that. Okay, so we have a motion from Director Perry and a second from Director Oysterman to adopt the consent calendar as presented. Do I have any comment from the public? One second. Yes, you. Yes, uh, actually, this is this is an aside. Uh, when doing these virtual meetings, I sure would like to know that uh, you can hear me before the meeting starts, and I would recommend that you basically 
engage the public uh, prior to the meeting so time doesn't have to be taken up just to verify uh, the sound. As you know, things, things happen and sometimes the audio doesn't work. Um, now, yes, I do have some questions on the consent calendar. I was noticing, um, you know, some of the bills like the after school sports um, uh, group seem to get a pretty good check from us. I, I know that there's a lot of programs being done. Um, and I'm just wondering, does the staff that we have on salary, do they teach classes too? Um, or are we basically contracting out um, most of the rec programs? Luke, I, I guess that would be Luke or Eric. I'm, we, we are contracting out most of the programs. Our staff is too small to be conducting numerous classes that are that came to be come to be expected by members of our community. Uh, okay, okay. Well, and and you know, once again, we see the money going out. We don't see what the revenue coming in is, and so it's or, you know for these programs. So it's really hard to evaluate. Um, you know, we are we are voting currently on bills paid, so uh, you would not see your revenues. I, yeah, on the I'm bills sorry. Paid. I, I believe I was talking, Isabella. Do you, do you mind? I I I'm just trying to understand what is happening with the cash flow of the district, and it's really it's it's very opaque. Um, we see a lot of we see a lot of expenses. Another expense that caught. Um, I noticed was another architecture firm, a residential architecture firm that has a sizable check going to it. And of course, Erd Schwartz's um, engineering firm got a nice check as well. Um, I, you know, three of you guys are, are finishing up your terms tonight, and, you know, the legacy of transparency has been very poor. Um, hopefully as taxpayers you'll take a different view of these things, but, um, and, and I know your heart's in the right place, you want uh, the best for the district, but uh, it's really hard to understand what's going on with the district when you don't, you know, basically divulge budgets and expenses. Um, so that's all I have to say at this moment. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Does anyone else from the public have um, a comment? No. Okay, hearing none. Uh, um, does anyone on the board have any further questions or comments on the consent calendar items? Hearing none, we have a motion to approve and a second. Um, Tiffany, would you like to take the roll call? Sure. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Hi. There you go. Uh, Director Oysterman. Hi. Director Perry. Hi. And Director Shea. Hi. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, board members. Okay, we'll move on to um, item E now. Public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. Yes, go ahead, Stephen. So, I, I guess we can talk about this later, uh, but uh, the first thing I wanted to do is uh, thank, thank you guys who are leaving uh, for your service. Um, you know, the legacy that you leave behind is, uh, you know, you've got some good things going. Um, we still have a uh, terrible problem with transparency. Uh, in the district and um, the needs of the full community are not being met. Uh, the uh, disabled uh, do not, uh, or mobility impaired people really do not have uh, safe access in our park and that's because you've ignored requests uh, for basic functional improvements uh, to 
access our park, um, park benches, um, fountains that don't work. Um, I, you know, I attend these meetings and, you know, there's a lot of happy talk and, you know, participation uh, trophies given for our employees to show up to work with very little accountability on um, some pretty important stuff, not only financial accountability, but uh, also, um, you know, the quality or and the, 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 the amount of work being done in our parks and our efficiency in, in meeting those objectives. I, you know, the, the, the maintenance in the parks has suffered um, and our, our uses of the, the park and open space has increased. So I guess part of this is a, a, uh, let's look forward to the future and um, see how we can do things better. Did you mute me? No? Hello? We hear you. We hear you. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I appreciate your comments. Um, I don't necessarily agree with most of it. Um, I think that given our staff levels, um, and the situation we found ourselves in this year, um, all staff is doing an admirable job. But thank you for your comments. 742. Okay, we move to item F, district matters. And um, item F1 is the fiscal year 2020-2021 uh, first quarter prop P&L and variance report. Eric, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jeff. All right, well, I gave you guys a bit of a, uh, a lead-in memo there with the staff report, um, just kind of painting the, the current picture. Again, this is a, a profit and loss, so it's just simply a look at uh, first quarter performance on uh, revenues and expenditures versus budgeted. Uh, so this is not, you know, looking at a balance sheet, although I do include some general uh, uh, balance sheet information within the note there, too. Um, a couple of the things, you know, obviously to highlight the, the cost fibers, as always, especially this time of year, our staff wages and benefits, um, our annual insurance payments and our pension payments uh, in regards to our unfunded accrued liability that we pay in a lump sum amount at the beginning of the year. Um, again, that's, you know, $407,000 this year, but paying it in a lump sum at the beginning of the year saves us a little over 14000 in annual interest payments if we pay it monthly and we're in a cash position fortunately to be able to pay it up front so that is a wise financial decision uh, one month yeah. into uh, quarter two so as of october 31st uh, we have the cash balance of our general fund of approximately 2.51 million uh, this is approximately three hundred and eighty thousand dollars higher than it was at the same point in time last year uh, which is and, uh, you know, the staff we feel pretty good about given the fact that we had a lot of the program reductions and staffing uh, revenue reductions uh, also flipped on the other side with a lot of expense reductions too so we're still are able to manage to uh, operate at a level where revenue has been exceeding expense um, especially considering you know eight months of that time was a very uh, irregular period um, regarding capital, the district currently has 300,000 of the above stated 2.5 million designated as capital reserves. Uh, this is derived from 100,000 in designations that occurred each of the past three years. Um, and right now we are on track to deposit another or to designate another 100,000 at the close of this fiscal year into that. Um, and then additionally, as of September 30th, our OPEB trust fund had a balance of $313,503 in it. Um, and I added some information there. For Q2, we anticipate approximately 55% of property taxes and special assessments will be recognized and allocated to our treasury fund. Um, and we will also, uh, at some point in Q2, I believe, should be receiving the first installment of our direct funding allocations excuse me, from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. 
at which they also anticipate, you know, kind of following the same general track as secured property taxes with 55% in December, um, you know, followed typically by about 40% uh, around April and then the last 5% usually right towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, otherwise, if there are any questions on this, I did include some various variance reports at the end. Um, I will say that uh, n nothing in here as we went through and, you know, really kind of looked at all of this was shocking. It all kind of fell in line with where we expected it, or I should say with where we yeah. hoped it would fall in line. And in some cases, even exceeding um, our estimates uh, from a revenue side too. So uh, with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Would anyone from the board like to ask questions of Eric on the variance report? I don't have questions. I just wanted to um, thank you for the exhaustive introduction and um, the explanation at the end. It really saved so much time um, for us um, with potential questions to just you know, flip a couple of pages and have all the answers provided. So it's immensely helpful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And I wanted to thank you for doing the various iterations so that we knew the different ways that this could fall so that none of this was a surprise for us. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Leah, Bill, any comment? Good work so far. I agree. Absolutely. Um, no, I found these to be very informative. Of course, we all understand um, the uh, periodicity of receiving revenue from government revenue and fee revenue. So um, this quarter will look, oh, or next quarter will look a lot different than this quarter does when you look at a uh, full-blown P&L. But um, it looks like we're tracking fairly well on uh, what has been budgeted. And Eric's pointed out some of the uh, some of the variances to the original assumptions, but. Um, particularly considering um, increasing the cash balance during this period um, is phenomenal. Very heartening. So um, great work by everyone um, to make that happen. And I just wanted to um, throw in another comment that um, this would be the place for the public to uh, gauge the financial performance of the district. Um, comparing uh, performance versus the budget um, and not necessarily from the bills paid. Um, we have included um, this presentation a number of times, but it seems like um, it might be difficult to understand for some. Yeah, and this is done on a quarterly basis, so rather than a monthly basis, and that's one thing we have to keep in mind. So keeping a copy of this um, you know, to sort of follow along or recall um, where we were at a particular point in time with the end of the quarter um, is probably information. But again, um, this next quarter, you're going to see revenue dollars start to flow in. And from an income statement standpoint, you'll start to see a much rosier picture than was presented at the end of the first quarter of the calendar year, or of the fiscal year, sorry. Okay, anything else from the board? Okay, questions from the public? One second. Uh, yeah, thing, Stephen. Yeah, first thing I'd like to say is uh, thank you for assembling this report. It does uh, add a little bit of clarity um, to it, but I, I want want to know, uh, and it, 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 says, it says really good things about the district, big picture. And the good things about the district is we have pretty good cash flow, stable income, um, and our businesses are, are pretty good. What it doesn't say, and it, or what it also says, is that we don't have adequate control of our expenses. And as as you know, um, you know, there's been a whole lot of expenses going out, and it seems like it always happens. Um, that we do make some gains in our in our uh, financial position, but not nearly uh, as good as we could do because we don't really uh, we don't do the things that successful businesses and successful government agencies do to 
manage our, our, our expenses. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, we knew that this whole um, pandemic was going to put a big monkey wrench in our financial condition this year. I remember at the uh, March meeting where I we were discussing the budget for the year and I, I said, hey, look, there's a hurricane coming and let's batten down the hatches, let's make some adjustments. And there were some adjustments, of course, we cut programs, but we didn't think about ways that we could either reduce staff or do things a little bit more efficiently. Instead, the expenses continued on uh, without really access to uh, the facilities that we pay for as taxpayers. So as you're looking at this as a big success, I look at these expenses and I go, well, gosh, you know, what did we get this year? We didn't get much. Uh, we didn't get much from our for our um, investment in in uh, in staffing, for example. And while other agencies did do some uh, uh, did use this as an opportunity to uh, streamline operations, we didn't. And so uh, we're we're pretty much doing things as we've always done them. Um, it's very disturbing to me that you, uh, when I talk to the general manager about the cost of the project uh, for the, in the park, he says, well, we don't know because we haven't spent the money yet, which is a BS answer. And I, I don't know if you guys are getting the same answer from them, but if you are, I'll tell you, we, we're, we're flying blind here with our expenses. We're, we're about ready to take a huge hit and our revenues are down. We, we're down $1.5 million in just three months. Um, I, you know, it's going to take a long, a long time to get our, our coffers filled properly and get back on track. So I guess a boring bill, but uh, it's kind of typical. Uh, anyhow, um, this is your legacy, guys, and, and I, I, you know, I know you're all experienced business people. I can't imagine that your individual businesses are run without more supervision than the supervision that we have in play in the district, and that's, I guess, that's something that I'd like you to communicate to the incoming uh, board in the opportunities for improving the district. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, Jeff, may I state something for the record? Um, we have not lost $1.5 million. It's um, It's again, it's difficult to understand the flow in government agencies. Um, the concept of the tax revenue arriving in our coffers only twice a year at specific time, every year at the same time, um, that kind of uh, impacts how the numbers look currently. Well, it, it, Thank you, Isabella. Uh, uh, hang on. Restating what I tried to state earlier, but um, again, any other comments from the board? Eric, thank you for a job well done in getting the variance report out. Are going to be muted now? Is that, is that the way it works? And to all of the staff for the efforts to align expenses with forecast revenues, um, which, frankly, if it hadn't been done, we wouldn't be seeing increases in cash surpluses, which, by the way, um, could be used to allocate over to a revenue line until we met, we actually received the fees um, from the government and make it look like it should at the end of the uh, second quarter. But that's just a bookkeeping um, issue and it's not something that's really worth staff's time to do. I think understanding that from a cash flow standpoint, we're, ca we're a cash accounting, um, organization. We are not an accrual accounting organization. So 
we recognize those revenues when they're received and they won't be received until the end of this just this calendar year okay let's move on um <clears throat> Item F2 is um, resolution 2020-07, fixing the employer contribution for employees and annuitants under the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act. Eric, would you like to lead us off? Sure, again, uh, I encourage you to reference the staff report that I included, but every year CalPERS uh, reviews, CalPERS is our health uh, carrier through the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act. Um, every year they review their rates, um, often resulting in adjustments. Um, as noted in here for the last two years, actually the rates were flat for our region. This year they went at approximately five and a half percent. And this is budgeted and planned for within the budget. The uh, the district has long-standing policies of paying set percentages of the health care premium for employers uh, based on classification and this uh, resolution changes the amounts that the district pays for employee health care in accordance with the rate difference and it needs to be submitted to CalPERS and it will become effective um, with the month of January. Questions from the board? This is a housekeeping item, more or less. It is more or less. We we have to submit a formal resolution to CalPERS to change the employer contribution. Our contributions are a set and stated percentage of the Kaiser premium for CalPERS. They they offer several different med medical plans. Uh, the Kaiser one uh, tends to be one of the more affordable ones, uh, and it is also the one that is chosen that we match a set percentage of their rate. So this year, uh, the set percentages that the district will pay is what's stated in the resolution itself. Okay. And so right. I'd like to move to uh, approve the resolution 2020-07, uh, fixing the employer contribution for employees and annuitants under the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act. I'll second okay. that. Okay, we have a motion by Isabel, Director Perry, sorry and a second from Director Oyserman. Um, any further conversation? I'd just like to say that I, I think Eric pointed that out in, in the write-up. The reason that this might not be too familiar is I think we've skipped at least one and possibly two years because the rates didn't change, but they have now. Yeah, so we did not do this last year. The rates stayed flat. Um, CalPERS used to have, I think, five or six regions that they based rates on. Uh, the Bay Area region used to be one of their regions, and it was actually the most expensive region in the state. And just based on the cost of health care here, they have since forth moved to three regions. We are now what is in the Northern California region, and last year they brought up all of the other areas that make up the now Northern California region, the Bay Area rates. Our rates actually stayed flat last year, but this year they will be going up by about five and a half. The year before, like two years ago, I think they actually went down maybe 1%. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else from the board on this particular topic, um, let's open it up to the public. One second. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. So I'm going to just go come out and say it. We, we have too many full-time employees uh, employed by the district. Um, it's just the, these expenses are what's going to kill us. This, these these health care expenses, these retirement expenses, and um, we just can't afford to have um, too many full-time employees. Some of the, the positions because they are seasonal in nature, it should be seasonal jobs. And um, I just think that, that the boards, oh, not just your board, but over the years, um, we've, we've grown and grown and grown, and, and we've added uh, full-time employees where they're not really uh, critical uh, towards our mission. Um, so I, I guess uh, you're going to vote on this of course uh, approve it um, but uh, 
Um, I, I think this is one of the areas that really needs to be looked at. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Jeff, may I just state for the record that over the last years we have actually uh, lowered the number of full-time staff and uh, we have not added any full-time positions. Yes, we've uh, reduced full-time staff count by at least two and possibly three um, by virtue talk, of uh, some uh, like layoffs in the park department, um, by virtue of the fact that we no longer have our own um, full-time employed um, fire chief. And we've also, if I recall, four or five years ago, we combined a director position um, that used to be two people. So yes, our employee count has diminished over the last four or five years. Thanks, Isabella. Uh, Jeff, okay. mm -hmm. if you want clarity on it, we have 18 full-time employees, nine of which are firefighters, four of which are in the rec department, uh, including Luke, who actually serves as the park and the rec director in a de facto role three park maintenance staff, uh, to your point, that used to be five, and then you have two admin staff for the entire agency. Right, and thank you for uh, pointing that out. I did forget one thing. We eliminated the relief firefighter position as well. Correct. So. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, there's no further discussion. Tiffany, could you? Your will, oh, Board cool. President Naylor. Aye. Uh, Director Green. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Yes. Thank you. That was four ayes and one yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on. Item F3, the district manager's report. Um, Eric. Sure. Um, well, this month, as you saw, you know, I, I felt personally uh, that the three outgoing directors being Director Naylor, Director Perry, and Director Green, um, you know, needed to be acknowledged. You've been in your positions now for five years. Many of you have served in other roles uh, previous on commissions uh, or in other terms on the board, uh, as well as commissions. So it's a uh, it's been quite a five years. It seems very short, and in some ways it seems very long, and I'm sure to the three of you it seems much longer than it does uh, to me, but I, I just I felt I wanted to take a second. I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to take a second and reflect, and you can see uh, a list that is far from inclusive of some of the things that this district has accomplished um, under your governance in the past five years primarily looking at you know a lot of the very critical policies that have either been created um, or revised um, the update and adoption of a long overdue policies and procedures employee handbook uh, formal bylaws you know things like things help with our website that is far improved over where that used to be uh, uh, the financial oversight that has resulted in you know what i would consider to be the most stable financial position the district has ever been in um, the creation of the opeb trust the very transparent and thorough analysis of our long-term pension liabilities uh, the list really does go on and it, it really is a sample of it and you know for your final meeting i i, I really wanted to give you the proper acknowledgement and uh, i know i don't need to remind you but it's a thankless role that you all play but i am saying thank you and you do it for free and you do it uh, uh, you know strictly as volunteers who want to have a positive impact on their community and and i can tell you that um, i'm excited about our incoming board members um, but you three will certainly be missed um, by me personally as well as by the impact you had on the community so thank you all very much for all of your service and i'm leaving my district manager report at that for this month we do it for free? <laughs> Damn, I was going to go spend all my earnings. Oh, <laughs> Eric, thank you very much for those kind words. Appreciate it. I'm sure my colleagues do as well. Anybody else uh, on the board like to comment? Um, I'd like to say um, thank you very much, President, um, who's our board member, uh, Green, 
and President Naylor for um, all your hard work on the board, uh, being fabulous president, both of you, um, Jeff, for all your financial work that you've done to uh, br really bring to light the um, liabilities the district faces and crystallize um, our position, help us um, develop a strategy to address those biggest problems in a, in a proactive, constructive way. Um, you both have been role models to me um, for your leadership. Um, Eric, I'd like to thank you for your tremendous work you've done over the years and um, working with you was a uh, really pleasure. Um, despite the fact that we might have disagreed sometimes, uh, we were honest with one another and um, that's that's very valuable thing to um, to have an open line of communication. But thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Isabel. Yes. And I just want to say thank you also for the It's been a pleasure to serve with everybody. And uh, yeah, uh, like I say, we all I think, kind of rotate in and out of these various service positions. So uh, I'm not going far, <laughs> but I'm uh, grateful for the time. Everything I've learned, I've learning. So, uh, yeah, I feel like we're leaving a good hands, and I'm glad that we've uh, got some things done along the way. Thank you all. You bet. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just close by saying uh, once again what an um, interesting experience this has been. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I do, you know, it was. Um, good of Eric to write down some of the accomplishments just because I have, I think we all have a tendency um, over a five year period to sort of um, move forward and not look back. So, yeah, it, it's very clear that there were some um, steps forward uh, during the five years that we were on the board. In particular, um, the policies and procedures that um, Isabella was so um, front and center with um, is a huge undertaking and um, has definitely set up the uh, district for a cleaner and better managed future. So thank you. And uh, Leah, what can I say? You were wherever you needed to be for this district. And um, I really appreciate your counsel. Um, you've been a terrific sounding board. And um, I appreciate your leadership as well. And I just uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all three of you. Um, you leave some really big shoes to fill, and I am in awe of everything that you guys have done, done for the district, uh, the amount of hours and time, um, and looking into the nitty gritty and making sure that things are clear and concise. Um, and I just thank you, and hopefully the next two years on my uh, watch, I can make you guys proud. Thank you, Sudan. I said they're going to pay a lick of attention to what happens with this board the day this meeting ends. But uh, you're making me weepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Okay. Any comment from the public? Yeah, one second. <laughs> this should be good. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. Hi, Bill. Uh huh. Um. Actually, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Isabella. And thank you, Leah. Um, I think I would agree. I think that you did uh, do some, uh, definitely improve the district. Um, and I appreciate all the positive things that you have brought to the district. I don't, I don't really think this is time to uh, talk about uh, things that uh, I, I feel lacking in the district. I, I do that pretty regularly. And uh, as a side note, when I do that and I'm talking, if you need to um, engage me or, you know, basically argue with, with the points that I bring up, I would appreciate to keep me in the conversation so we can actually uh, come to some common understanding. All three of you are now, you know, citizens, I guess. Uh, uh, hopefully you'll stay 
involved and uh, maybe we'll see each other out on the trails or in the park. I hope to uh, get to know you a little better and maybe uh, reset our relationship. Uh, but uh, what I know of you in this limited capacity so far, I do know that uh, your people, each one of you, are, you know, are, have good hearts and you're, you definitely have a passion for the community, which I also share. And um, I just hope that we can continue to grow as a community. So thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate your words. Anybody else from the public? Uh, okay. Seeing none, we'll move to um, item G, fire department matters. Uh, first, the draft minutes of the November 3rd fire commission meeting. Does anyone on the board have any questions or comments? Should we talk about the radios or here? Uh, that'll, that'll be, I believe, is in part of the chief's report. Okay. So then I won't mention that. Too late. <laughs> okay. Any comments again from the board <laughs> on the meeting minutes? Okay. Um, comments from the public? No. No. Okay. We'll move on. Um, item G2, appointment of fire commissioners for the term beginning January 1st, 2021. Sure. Um, last month, uh, there was notices that were put out. It went out uh, via social media, via our website, um, uh, postings on the bulletin boards as well as you know some word of mouth that went out um, based on that uh, as you can see we have three regular commission seats they can be appointed for two-year terms we have one vacant alternate commissioner seat that's been vacant for the past year with a term expiring at the end of December 2021 um, at this point in time there's two members of the community both are current commissioners who have submitted um, a request to be reappointed they are Tom Ellsbury and Stephen Farrak their letters are included in this packet. Um, staff recommendation is to appoint both Mr. Ellsbury and Mr. Farrak for uh, additional two-year terms. I would like to move to appoint Commissioner, Commissioner Ellsbury and Commissioner Farrak to uh, two-year terms, respectively. I'll second, second it because Isabel beat me to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if I understand it properly, um, these two reappointments will leave one regular position and one alternate position open. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Fair enough. The only other comment I have to make is I think uh, Tom Ellsbury was on the fire commission before I got there. So his comment about having served the fire commission sure. for several years made me laugh. I would say several decades, maybe, but several years. At least two. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Well, in uh, Tom's defense, he's a very uh, participatory commissioner. Yes, yes, indeed. So um, I'd like to thank them both for their service. And, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to have them return. Yeah. And then, um, Jeff, to clarify, um, there, there has been a vacant regular position now for a while, ever since Russ Albano uh, voluntarily resigned from the commission. So uh, we don't have any commissioners who are coming off at this point in time who have not requested to be reappointed. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Is there any further comment from the board? From the public? Yeah, well, yes, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, the, the lack of applications for these commissions should uh, tell the board something. The outreach uh, to the public is insufficient, even though you, you know, put it on next door and wherever. Um, we really need to be announcing our meetings so people know uh, what is going on. These are important positions, actually. 
they're spending you know much of our budget uh, the the fire commission is and you know gosh and you guys are just interesting people I, it, uh, it's very frustrating that there's uh, so little um, participation in the community with our community affairs I would like not to be the only person uh, talking to you about uh, concerns from the public but I guess you know so that's really all I, I need to say but uh, I'd like to see you know us get out from just reappointing the same uh, click of you know people from the same group of people um, I I think that's a that's a, an outreach issue that really does need to be addressed. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, we'll move on to item G three, uh, Chief Officer Report and Activities. Jeff. Yeah. Um, I think we need a motion and a vote to actually appoint these people. We do. Yeah, it's funny that way. I don't. I didn't think we voted on that. We just simply accepted their appointments. No? Uh, okay. I'll I think be... we've always voted on it in the past. Oh, well, okay. I didn't put that down as a voting thing, but all right, fair enough. Um, okay, Tiffany. Yes, sir. Uh, President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Lee, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Thank you. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Bill, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. You're, you're muted. You're muted, Bill. And there's a reason for that. Aye. Thank you. Oh, we had all eyes that time. Excellent. <laughs> Informative. Okay. Sorry for that snafu. I, I thought a point was a point, not both. You know, just in time, I've learned that lesson. All right, uh, item G3, Chief Officer Report and Activity Summary. Chief? Good evening, can everyone hear me? What? Oh, that's great, I'm sorry, I had to connect from my cell phone, I ran into some difficulty with my laptop, so just wanted to make sure I could be heard uh, fairly easily right now. Um, good evening, uh, Board of Directors and uh, District Manager Drykosen and the community members who've joined us today. I'm happy to report on uh, this month's uh, thing, activities of sorts, starting with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. As planned and discussed previously, the NCCC and AmeriCorps crews both arrived on October 29th. We have a total of 17 individuals who are now out working within the communities. Um, working in our open spaces and at some point here in the very near future, providing direct assistance to homeowners who are um, in need of assistance with their vegetation uh, management and or fuel reduction projects in their homes. Uh, on my report, I actually provided uh, two links. One is an email address, the other is a link. That's www.cityofmerfell.org backslash wildfire dash prevention dash assistance backslash and that helps you reach out and uh, obtain some of the assistance and, or excuse me, information about the assistance that you can receive. And then there's the, the need to email specifically our vegetation management staff at srfd.dspace at cityofsanrafael.org. And so for anyone that you know of that could, could benefit from some assistance from some very uh, enthusiastic, hardworking, young adults, this would be uh, the time to do it. Uh, I'm happy to say also it looks like we'll have a third crew joining us in December. Um, this is this is huge, I gotta tell you. I haven't seen this in very many other communities and so for us to be able to get almost season round assistance from these volunteer crews at minimal expense is just um, very encouraging and I'm hoping that this program can expand uh, and who knows, at some point we might be able to get it almost year round if they continue to get the number of volunteers and have the capacity to assist us with our um, our needs here in Marinwood and Marin County in general. Um, moving on, uh, Director Mark Brown, last uh, Tuesday, the election day, took a group of a couple of dozen individuals to Santa Rosa. Um, these individuals are 
D space inspectors, vegetation management specialists, wildfire mitigation specialists, and others to perform a walkthrough of some of the neighborhoods in Santa Rosa that were immediately impacted by some of the recent fires. And if you look at the photo that I included on page one of the report, I wish I could have dialed in a little bit tighter, but there's two or three homes in the photo that were devastated by fire, while the rest of the homes remain virtually untouched or just barely singed based on the fact that they had done substantial home hardening in those areas. And so even if you look at some of the burn areas, you can see where vegetation that was cleared was you know, literally untouched. It's not discolored, but you can see the dark brown or black areas where fire had burned through. But all in all, this was a great example of some hardening in neighborhoods where this, um, this effort was taken very seriously. And as a result, those, uh, that community or those communities had minimal impact from fire. And so I think Director Brown from the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority really recognized early on this might be a great chance for folks to get video and photographs to bring back to their communities and share how those measures can really make a difference when you face an actual um, catastrophic event like our community seem to keep facing over the last few years here. So um, with that, I encourage everybody to continue to do their due diligence and work hard to um, keep their property safe on a year round basis and harden outward from your property as far out as you possibly can, starting right at the house. Um, the further away you can keep your vegetation um, to a minimum, the less likely you have something encroach directly on your home. That being said, um, uh, next next page, there's a, a snapshot of the AmeriCorps crew from St. Louis. Um, these folks are here for two months, and the first week or two they've spent so far in the San Pedro Scatrini Fire Road area. And speaking to Sean Rule, I think they've got some plans for Marinwood here in the very near future. And it's probably either going to come right after the Thanksgiving break or just before, but I've got to get confirmation on that. Um, I'm going to move on to COVID and guidelines. A couple of weeks ago, the governor's office moved Marin County from the red to the orange tier. And this is very concerning to me for a number of reasons. It looked like at one point we were getting close to being moved or qualified to move into even the yellow status or the ye yellow tier. And what uh, enables you to actually reach another lower tier is meeting certain thresholds and criteria for a three week period. Um, I think, depending on who you talk to, some folks fear we're, feel that we're still closer to the red tier as opposed to moving closer to the yellow tier. And so, and I'm speaking of emergency management staff um, in the county and in the, the city of San Rafael and others. So I, my concern is maybe a little premature, but it's also tempered with the idea that we already have a lot of indoor activity already taking place. And as we're starting to see in the, the state of California and slightly here in Marin County, there's an increase in COVID cases being reported. And so uh, it's pretty clear across the country where we're starting to reach peaks that we haven't even seen before. Or not even, um, maybe such that are moving forward too quickly or somehow or another folks are not doing their due diligence with hand washing, social, social distancing and using their mask. And so, with that, um, there's still some indoor activities uh, capable, and I think as long as those businesses and individuals frequenting those businesses continue to do social distancing and be responsible, we may not see an increase in our county. Um, I think our county at some point may actually turn out to be the model for others based on the fact that we don't have as much or the same level of increase as others. But um, <laughs> With that, I'm going to say also that I believe that there could be something coming forward in January from a national standpoint that may give guidance to each state as a national COVID guidance that may change some of what we're doing at the local level. So we'll know more in the next several weeks about that. But um, for right now, it looks like we're holding steady in the orange tier and not moving towards yellow or moving up back towards red, depending on how things play out over the next several weeks. Um, ironically, there's some reopening of some government services slated for this Thursday, such as in San Rafael City Hall and other parts of the community there. They're looking at 
having a, a presence back indoors in some of the facilities and government services that were primarily handled from a remote standpoint. So I have more information on that uh, towards the end of the week, and I'll be sure to share that as um, as I need to about the, the reopening and or the um, degree to which the reopening is taking place. Can I ask a follow-up question before you move on about this? Sure. So with Newsom saying that he's going to make it more stringent and stuff and that some counties may be falling backwards, we have not fallen backwards. Okay. Right. Right. No, we've not fallen backwards. And I think for the first couple of weeks, I, I really thought we were moving towards the yellow tier because we had met the criteria to be able to move forward. I think that third week may have been a critical slight adjustment that kept us from being qualified to move into the yellow tier. Um, and that's just based on information that I, I had gleaned from a couple of different sources. But um, again, some of the experts and folks who have more background and experience in this tend to feel that we're not as close to the yellow tier as I may have feared. We're closer probably to the red tier than to the yellow tier. And so fortunately for us right now, it looks like we're going to hold steady where we are. That could change, though, depending on um, any number of things that happen in the next few weeks. But I think the governor is taking a, a strong approach, as are some of the other mayors and other communities. Based San Francisco, as an example, I think they started to scale back some of their opening. And uh, given the increase in infections, given the um, increase, or should I say, the lack of a vaccine right now, I think that makes sense. Um, I always had my concerns about premature reopening of schools, as an example, and that those fears still exist for me. Um, and I think. Those, those concerns exist also with the teachers and some of the faculty who are concerned about how maybe individual students or families are taking, you know, pre uh, pre how should we say, the precautions seriously or not taking those precautions seriously. So in the meantime, to just not find yourself in a predicament, like I just saw on the news earlier, I think it was Branson School, and I'm not sure which community it was in. They may have had some sort of Halloween party, and as a result, COVID infection started, and then they had to go back to online learning at that school just as a result of a one party. So um, again, maybe a little premature, even though everyone's getting stir crazy at home, you know, you still have to approach this from a very cautious um, um, perspective. So National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, funding from the Marin Wildfire Prevention and Protection Authority rather, was used to purchase about a thousand Midland WR120 NOAA radios and these weather radios are for a pilot program that's going to be launched to test the effectiveness of radios as a backup warning system here in marin county and so with that we have alert marin excuse me alert marin we have nixel we have everbridge but if for any reason those systems went down because of cell towers not operating or power uh, public safety power shutdowns or other reasons we really would kind of have some challenges now making emergency uh, alerts and wireless emergency alerts especially. So I'm really excited to see that the old school technology is actually a very functioning and very reliable technology and that these radios don't require you to have a power source and they can be used uh, in the middle of the night to weigh individuals very reliably from what I understand, provided you leave the radios on. Um, with that though, the um, NOAA understands clearly that they don't want to just make any basic announcement about a red flag warning or some other watch or other condition, which isn't a real pending, serious mission critical emergency that they need to communicate to everyone. Otherwise, people will get to a point where they kind of feel it's diluted. It doesn't have the same importance that it should have. They'll turn the radios off. And then at the worst possible time, when they really need the messaging, they're not gonna be able to receive it. So with that, um, there were roughly, I think 200 plus for San Rafael and um, Marinwood. And I think Marinwood re received somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 or 17 radios. Um, we're really encouraging individuals who are leaders of firewires communities to consider taking on the responsibility for a radio. But also I think there's been some discussion about the board of directors and others who are in leadership roles also um, testing out the radios and getting access to the radios. And the hope is at some point down the road, we'll be able to acquire more radios and distribute them on a more widespread basis. But from what I understand, they're not very expensive. They may cost 
somewhere in the $25 to $35 range. Um, but again, being that the MWPA has some radios, we're looking to distribute those radios to folks that may be interested. And I know there's going to be some folks that say thank you, but no thank you. But um, perhaps there'll be others that will look at this as a valuable resource that they want to actually put in their home and, and use it to, uh, to receive information if and when something were to happen. And Chief White, Eric is holding it up. So if people want to know what it looks like, there it is. Oh, okay. I can't see that. All I can see is you right now. I can't see anybody else. All right. Um, I put it up right here, Chief. There we go. Nice. Yeah. So you can see it. Um, and before you move on, if you don't mind, I jump in here really quick. Yes. We did receive 16. Uh, this has been a topic that the fire commission has been talking about for quite a while, these very specific radios. Um, when I was originally contacted by Firewise, they, to Chief White's point, they uh, were very enthusiastic about the idea of distributing them to our commissioners. This is a pilot project, <laughs> excuse me. So, um, you know, names and contact information will be distributed back to Firewise. There'll be follow-up requests for information and feedback on uh, effectiveness and use and things like that. So it's a bit of a, of a research project as well. But uh, we will circle back with the commission on how to distribute the, the remaining. Thank you. Um, personnel, uh, Marin Wood Fire Captain Ryan Brackett submitted a request to begin a task book as a strike team leader. Um, he had sent me an email uh, maybe about a week or two ago. Uh, I didn't have a chance to respond directly to that. So today I took the opportunity to swing by while he was on duty and just have a one-on-one -on -one with him and the crew. Uh, I think it was a, a pretty good conversation. We uh, got a chance to had, had the chance to learn a little bit more about uh, how I view the department, how I, I view training, um, some of the things that are important to me as fire chief. And so uh, I was encouraged by the conversation. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to speak to Eric about a little bit offline. These are small matters, nothing that the, the board of directors need to really concern themselves with. But um, that being said, uh, he's had nearly 20 wildfire incidents under his belt as an engine boss and um, trainee. And I think moving forward, it's, it's important that we support our members who have an interest in trying to learn more and be the best possible fire service professional they can be. And so I told him, even though this position tends to be battalion chief or above, from what I understand, there are also many other agencies that are letting captains actually work as strike team leaders from Sonoma County to even some agencies here in Marin County. And so with that, um, you know, I, I support his, his growth. I also established uh, some expectations that I'd like to see surrounding his involvement as a training officer for Marinwood as well. So we'll, um, we'll see some definite things in the way of a training calendar moving forward for the year 2021. And those things will tie in with some of the other regional training that takes place, but I also wanted to tie in with some of the training with the first new companies that occur right within our district. So if San Rafael um, Engine 56 or Engine 57 respond for an incident, all three can work seamlessly and understand what they're doing, why, and how, and pretty much get very familiar with one another on all three shifts so that they kind of operate like a, a orchestra, if you will, just playing harmoniously at an incident. So um, but that's a separate conversation. That, that's more operational in nature. I just wanted you to have the understanding that you had one of your own here who are really uh, looking to try to improve his, his, uh, his skills and experience in a very important aspect of the fire service, wildfire. Very good. Lack of preparedness. Uh, we took it upon ourselves, you know, well ahead of the election to start um, looking at how can we prepare in the event there's some unrest. And that happened based on a lot of the experience I had in Oakland with unrest, with, um, how should we say, parades, celebrations, um, you name it. We, we, we've had quite a bit of experience in Oakland. And so I, I recognize that Marin County hasn't always had the same challenges or issues that some of the other counties and agency had. I've had experienced recently, but I've also noticed this year that there's probably been a slight change in some of the things that were happening in Marin County. And as a result, I mentioned it to the police chief. She seemed to be in agreement. I mentioned it to 
the Marine County Fire Chiefs Association. I think they saw value in it as well. And so we, um, we developed an incident action plan and we partially activated remotely. Uh, we staged the EOC in San Rafael, but the Marine County Emergency Ops Center actually staffed up, especially on election day for a several hour period. And then they continued on into the second day just um, as a precaution to see whether or not things were going to escalate anywhere. And fortunately, um, we did not see anything escalate here in the county. I know this past weekend there was some sort of protest planned over at the Golden Gate Bridge where they were going to shut down the, Bay, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge for a two-hour period. I don't know if that ever materialized. I didn't hear anything more about it. Um, so with that, as of yesterday, the ELC has been um, deactivated fully and at this point, we have really nothing more to, to speak to regarding the election and or any unrest. I'm really happy to see that that's the reality. Very good. Last piece, I'm sorry. No, I have good, good news. Yes. Last but not least, um, our times in Marinwood are now back to that same consistent number that I've seen in the past. And so I joke that Either we're just creatures of habit and somehow or another we're doing things almost like robotic or there's something happening with the system that's not capturing things so that five minutes, 58 seconds is not the average response time every month. Um, there was just one or two months where we went to five minutes, 52 seconds, I think, or five minutes, 42 seconds. But right now we're at five minutes, 58 seconds. And don't get me wrong, that's an excellent total response time. I just have concerns when I see the same number over and over again, that there's a, a ghost in the system or something's not quite accurate. But that being said, um, really no significant uh, incidents to report for the month of October. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. There were um, some fires and some other responses that uh, we responded to as, um, as a mutual aid agency. And some of those were, were not really um, there were unfortunate incidents. I'll just summarize it that way. But um, we're very fortunate not to have any negative things happen within our community this past month. And I'm gonna knock on some wood somewhere and hope that, that continues at least through the end of the year. Does anyone very have any good. questions? Yeah, questions from the board? Uh, should we mention when the, um, whatchamacallit, the Santa's gonna come through with the fire? Isn't that? December 17th? Uh, it's tentative oh. right now, and they're trying to arrange to see if Santa might be able to make it into town the weekend of December 12 and That's 13. The but there's still some logistics to work out with that, um, given uh, uh, everything going on with the public health situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that'll be announced if and when it is confirmed. OK, just want to make sure it was up. Yeah, we don't want to see Santa wearing a mask. I mean, come on. Let's do a virtual Santa. Weird, huh? <laughs> anyway, yeah, I know the little kids in our neighborhood um, love love it when they show up. Anything else from the board? Okay, comment from the public. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, hi, Chief White. A uh, few questions. Uh, thanks for your report. Um, the picture uh, that you have of Santa Rosa uh, is that uh, it's it's a valley and there's a uh, well, you know what what the picture is. Is that what you envision um, Marinwood or Lucas Valley is going to look like after you complete your um, vegetation management? No, I think if you just look at that area, that's a wide open space area where there is um, just a complete, I should I say, removal of vegetation. Um, uh, that's almost like a clear, complete clear uh, landscape. I don't expect Marinwood to look like that, not at all. Okay, well, the reason I bring that up, uh, I know uh, John Campo also uh, expressed concerns. Um, if we were to have such aggressive management, and I know you, you've said that you don't want to do that, um, there would definitely be some environmental concerns. You know, maybe the, maybe this is the best way to go. I, I don't know, but but I think it it uh, before any 
such project were to take place, uh, I, I strongly urge the, the fire uh, department to uh, uh, take this, this ma- the concerns of the public seriously because it would definitely change um, the feel of the valley if we were to uh, get very aggressive with cutting back uh, vegetation. Um, the uh, other thing is, uh, with regards to the radios, um, I'm, I'm a skeptic on that. I, I believe that sirens and bells and other simple audible signals are probably a better uh, technical solution to rousting the public in the middle of the night most especially people who uh, may have impairments or, you know, they, they, they may not plug in their radios. They certainly would hear a bell or a whistle or, or a horn. And I guess that would be, that's the contingency plan. If you had uh, an emergency tonight, a wildfire tonight, I imagine you would be uh, setting off um, sirens and perhaps the sheriff would be, uh, sending patrol cars in the neighborhood, making announcements. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm really very skeptical at, at having a, uh, uh, a two-way device, uh, government, government two-way device, uh, listening in, in my, my household. And I'm, plus the fact I'm not even sure that it would, would work well um, in the configuration of my house. So I, I'm just throwing this out there. I, 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 one of the problems having a uh, uh, basically a closed fire commission is that you talk to each other and it tends to be an echo chamber, but you really do need it, the public buy-in for whatever you, you're planning here. I have a ham radio, I have emergency radios, so I don't n- not, I, I am not seeing the value in what what these radios are about, um, but you know perhaps I could learn more I, of the advantages. Just, so if I could just offer one thing here. Yeah. Um, along with everything else that we're doing, it's a redundancy. I think the the goal is if one thing fails, we have other things that we can simultaneously put in play that help achieve community safety. And so as many things as you can put on the plate and manage effectively. I think it, it covers all bases because the public safety power shutdown could impact our community. The, the fact that wire, wireless emergency alert systems could be overwhelmed at some point and radio traffic or excuse me, cell traffic and other information may not get through if there's a region wide use of the system as an example, that's a legitimate concern. And so I think the redundancy is what we're looking at here is that if for whatever reason there's a failure in one area, we have something as a backup that works in another area that we can re- potentially rely on okay well i just i uh, yeah i i i i i'm as much as i'm into technology i realize that it has its problems this seems like a very technologically driven solution when um a fail-safe mechanical means of of communication i.e horns and bells and whistles and other things to me makes so much more sense but but i don't want we don't have to discuss I, to that. my knowledge from what i understood sorry chief to interrupt this is not just a horn or a whistle this is going to give directions which the horn and the whistle when it's being sounded you don't know where the fire is coming from and in what direction it's moving and if you have to leave now or what the thing is. And from my understanding, these NOAA radios would give more than just an audible sound of there's fire. It would give you more information on top of that. And from my understanding on top of that was that because of the PSPs, this is what we can do. And we would be going and in a way doing a phone tree without a phone where you would knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, just a heads up, like if they don't have one, this is going on, and then they would pass it on so that more people would find out about it also. Is that correct, Chief? Absolutely. And I think it's 
it's helpful to understand as many sirens that we rely on sometimes sirens are maintained or sirens can fail so you know while we want to rely on those those systems and maintain those systems the best we can sometimes fiscal realities and or equipment malfunctions take place and so again for me i look at these as redundancies and i think the more redundancies we put in play the better protected we are very good okay Anything else from the public? No, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and um, I guess my, my concern is, is that I, I envision the 90-year-old grandma uh, who wakes up confused in the middle of the night to the sound of a radio, or maybe she hasn't plugged it in. You know, the most vulnerable people are going to be the ones that can't handle what you're you're offering them whereas uh a bell a whistled you know a sounding alarm is going to be something that everyone would you know respond to very quickly but that's another discussion i i we don't have to discuss this tonight okay thank you Stephen. appreciate it jeff if you don't mind if i could um keeping in mind that all of this is actually being kind of guided and uh, I don't want to say driven, but thoroughly researched through the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, which is countywide, consists of almost every town, every agency, uh, every emergency services district. Uh, so it's being looked at, you know, in terms of a best practice at a countywide level for consistency so that uh, all alerts across the county are mean the same thing, which right now they don't. So this is part of the study. Uh, and the main reason I bring that up and it um, doesn't affect some of our outgoing board members in terms of their role on the board. Uh, Director Mark Brown of the MWPA has reached out. He does wanna come and present and introduce himself to the board. Um, and we're going to do that shortly into the new calendar year. So he will actually join one of these meetings uh, and speak on behalf of the MWPA at a future date. Thank you, Eric. And Chief, thank you for your usual very thorough report. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. <coughs> and there are no further comments from the public. Okay. Next fire commission meeting, December 1st, 2020. Okay, now we'll move on to uh, park and rec matters. Um, item H1, draft minutes of the park and rec commission meeting of September, September 22nd? No, it was the, October 27th. Okay. Did I not, did I? That's all right, October 27th, I guess. Yes, no, it's right on there. So October twenty yeah. seventh, yeah, that was the date of the meeting. Yep. Yeah. Any questions or comments from the board? Nothing. Okay. Um, any comment from the public? Nope. None. Okay. We'll move on. Um, Item H3, PNR maintenance activity report. Oh, wait a minute, of Park and Rec commissioners as well. Sorry, H2, um, which will definitely require a vote. Um, Eric, would you like to present that? Sure. Um, so much similar to the fire commission, um, in this case, we have uh, two regular commissioner seats that are becoming available, one alternate commissioner seat um, that can also be appointed for a two-year term. So those are all two-year terms. Additionally, we have vacant commissioner seats with, uh, with terms that are going to expire at the end of this calendar year. You can see the list of the people as well as the letters that they submitted requesting appointment. Um, one is Ann Shawsome, another is John Toon, both of whom are currently on the commission seeking reappointment. And then another member of the community, a gentleman named Ian Fine, has also applied to join the commission, which is great. Um, staff recommendation is to appoint 
all three to the commission and designating which applicants will serve two year terms and which will be appointed to the vacant seat for a one year term. Keeping in mind that at the end of that term, they can always reapply uh, for a full two year seat, uh, assuming uh, at that point in time. Very good. Anyone on the board have a question or a comment or a motion? Uh, Isabella. Um, Eric, is, isn't uh, Commissioner Shahaz, Shazam um, one of the incoming new board members? Yeah, no. and it's not, no. And it's not? No. Okay. Well, in Just this case, I would like to make a motion. <laughs> okay. To um, approve um, uh, we have two. You have two two, two year terms, and, <laughs> and one uh, one one year term in terms of regular seats. It doesn't. Right. I, I wouldn't. You're not going to fill the alternate seat because we have vacant regular seats. Right, right, right. So, so therefore, I would like to uh, reappoint Commissioner Shahas. I'm Shasam. sorry, Shasam. Yes, of course. And Commissioner Tiun uh, for two-year term, and um, uh, welcome um, Mr. Ian Thane as a commissioner for fine. fine. I'm sorry, I'm horrible with pronunciation. So um, Commissioner Ian Fine um, to a one-year position. I'll second that. Okay, as per usual, we have a motion from Director Perry and a second from Director Oysterman to appoint the returning commissioners to the two-year terms and the incoming new commissioner to a one-year term. Any further conversation? Nothing from the board? Okay, uh, members of the public? One second. Yes, Steve. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad we have three commissioners, but I'd love to see five commissioners. Um, and I think this is uh, another problem with the outreach. We really need more people uh, involved in our uh, in the management of our community, um, especially with our beautiful open space. I would recommend that um, that you do some think the board thinks about doing additional outreach and also having an open space plan what what are we going to do to improve our, our trails um, uh, reduce uh, fire risk and erosion um, and also see how it can be a more um, a, a, a better recreational resource for our community I, I I really feel that we focused way too much on the community center and and activities uh, around Marinwood Park where you know we really have so much more to offer our public so uh, just a just a food for thought I guess okay thank you Stephen appreciate it is anybody else from the public interested in it. It didn't look like it. Um, there's nothing else from the board. Um, Tiffany, if you could sure. uh, pull the board. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Hey, Bill. Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, that's unanimous. Um, Anne and John are reappointed to the two-year term and incoming Ian Fine to the um, one-year term. All right. Moving on to item H3, Park and Rec Maintenance Activity Report. Luke? Thank you, Jeff. How long, long last? last? How long last? <laughs> um, well, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, on October 30th, um, in lieu of our normal Halloween Harvest Festival, uh, which we were not able to put on um, for obvious reasons this year, um, 
the recreation department put on a Halloween trick or treat drive through, which I know a number of other uh, places have been uh, trying out this year. And, um, which was a huge success. We, we decorated, uh, the staff decorated cars and we dressed up and, um, for a few hours, uh, a couple hours on, on, on Friday, um, members of the community could drive through and, uh, pick up, you know, kind of do a drive through trick or treat. We had some music playing and, um, we weren't sure what the uh, turnout was going to be, but we ended up um, being completely busy the, the whole time. Thankfully, we didn't cause any major traffic incident, uh, which I was uh, slightly worried about at one point. But um, yeah, it was great to see all these cars come through, kids and, and parents in costumes, and we were able to give them a little bit of a, of a socially distant trick-or-treating experience. Um, by the end of the night, we, we handed out uh, candy and, and some activity trick-or-treat bags to uh, just over 400 uh, kids um, not 400 cars but 400 individual kids and uh, was busy from start to finish so that was a super fun uh, event and we're and people were really appreciative to be able to have something to do on Halloween um, under the current circumstances so um, big thanks to the recreation staff um, without whom we wouldn't have been able to, to do an event like that so that was a, a lot of fun I dressed as a bear, um, so in case any of you didn't see it. And we actually made the front page of the Marin IJ, um, both the print version and online. So um, yeah, we were right at the top with a, with a big story on uh, Halloween events in Marin. So that was um, a nice surprise and it was fun to be featured, uh, get, get a little bit more visibility there for our programs and our, and our uh, department. Um, and then uh, kind of concurrently, that same day was the end of our virtual art show that ran for a couple weeks on our Facebook page, uh, where every day we, we uh, posted five pieces of artwork from uh, the artists that were supposed to be featured in our last couple art shows with a little blurb about their, um, their work of art. And uh, that we had a huge uh, engagement on Facebook uh, from, from that event, or there was a huge uh, positive response and people were really appreciative. And I think the artists were really appreciative to have a platform to, to show off uh, some of the artwork they had made specifically for our event. So after um, about a year, we we're finally get, get, to, to, get to put these uh, artworks on display. So I want to thank Susan Press for organizing that and Carolyn Sullivan for taking care of um, uploading and, and making sure everything made it to the, to the Facebook page. And um, we look forward to hopefully our next in-person event, but um, uh, but maybe maybe virtual um, in, the, in the next season. So we'll see what happens. Uh, and then one last event that we were able to do uh, was a, a fun service project partnering with the Las Colinas Lions Club uh, to carve pumpkins for uh, PDS, which is People with Disabilities Succeeding, which is a local, um, uh, local program for people with disabilities that we have worked with uh, for decades at Marinwood. Um, uh, different subgroups from, from that organization have come and used our pool. They come to our park multiple days a week to get exercise and fresh air. And one of um, the members of that group is our very own guy, Doers, who has been employed here for just about a decade, uh, working part-time doing cleanup uh, janitorial work for us and uh, has been a great friend of, of Marinewood for most of his life. And so it was fun for uh, us to, we had a, some of our part-time staff come in and, and carve pumpkins that were donated by the Lions Club and then the Lions Club delivered the carved pumpkins. And so that was a really fun uh, way to kind of um, to do a little bit of a service project and, and bring some Halloween cheer to, to that group who has been uh, cooped up for a lot of the COVID season and, and uh, not able to, to get out and do some other activities. So um, I want to thank the Lions for inviting us to participate in that and um, and uh, yeah, hopefully they, they, they enjoyed that. Uh, we're not sure exactly what we're going to do for um, for our, our normal winter time event. Normally we do our winter fest open house, um, but we will be doing something uh, different in lieu of that. Staff are working on a few things, and we'll be announcing that in the coming days, um, and with some emails and on our website and some banners. So uh, there will be some events the rec staff will be putting on this uh, winter, but uh, you know details are still coming for that. Uh, we've got a lot of classes and programs still running. I think we talked about them last month, but um, we've been utilizing our outdoor space with a bunch of new programs with sports camps, a golf program for kids, a music program for children, all utilizing the park every day. So it's been really fun to see the park just hustling and bustling with uh, kids and, and uh, families for, um, you know, for the first time in a little while. And that's been great. And we're now able to start offering some indoor programming. And uh, we've got some programs starting this week, including Jazzercise. 
and we'll be having some dance classes starting uh, in, in the near future. So the staff have been hard at work coordinating with instructors, um, making sure everyone understands the guidelines and uh, getting all the protocols in place to continue to open up the community center to, to some more of these, these programs besides preschool and our after school program, which we've been running all fall. Uh, pool closed uh, last Friday um, after uh, our short season of lap swim and swim team and then, you know, using the pool for the summer camps. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to have the pool open in, in some capacity in spite of all of the challenges that this season presented. Uh, I just want to thank Stephanie for, and her staff for um, uh, adapting so well and being able to, to make that possible and, and have a pool be a safe place for, uh, for the people that were able to come and utilize it. So, uh, and we turned off the heaters just in time for the cold spell. So I'm um, glad to, to not be heating the pool right now. So that's the helpful thing. Uh, moving on to the parks maintenance side of things. Uh, we've had a lot of progress on the parks, the new parks maintenance facility project this past couple weeks. Uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, have noticed the the little workspace that's been erected on the north end of the park. Um, that'll be where the parks maintenance staff will be working um, through the duration of the demolition and construction of the new facility. We have two uh, 40-foot cargo containers, a small mobile office um, set up, and it's all been fenced in with all of the equipment and vehicles uh, that, that we that our staff use. Um, so it's been a big process moving everything over there, getting all that set up and uh, organized, and there's still some work to be done, but we're completely moved out of the old space and it is uh, ready for demolition at this point, which will be starting um, on Monday, I believe. And so uh, that's been a, been a big task. Uh, it's not an ideal workspace. The staff don't have any plumbing. They're going to be using um, either the community center as needed or um, we've got a porta potty out there for them. Uh, limited water access, limited electricity, limited lighting, and um, so it's uh, less than ideal for, for working through the winter, um, especially if we get any rain, but um, staff have good attitudes and they're making the most of it and we're creating a, a space that's as functional as possible to keep up with the maintenance of the parks and the buildings um, during, uh, during this project. Um, power should be up and running um, in the next week or so. Uh, as uh, we've been working with PG&E, DC Electric in the county to coordinate um, moving the, uh, the meter and, and getting the uh, wires run to, to the new mobile office. So um, once that's up and running, we'll, we'll sort of be fully functional uh, <laughs> finally for the, for the staff. So that's been a, um, a big uh, to do this last uh, few weeks and we're, we're very grateful to, to um, be pretty much ready to go for this next season. Uh, we had some erosion. Uh, damage at the pool this last week um, on October 29th, we, due to some of the erosion at the creek, part of the cliff just outside the uh, the top pool um, fell down and, and took out a chunk of our fence and a chunk of our concrete and um, damaged some of our irrigation. Uh, thankfully, the, the damage to the deck uh, was minimal and the pool itself wasn't affected, but um, the staff were able to get the irrigation repaired quickly and um, they're working on fi fixing the fence and getting that all um, repaired. But we did lose a big chunk of earth and um, erosion continues to be um, an issue uh, around the pool complex and um, something that we definitely want to continue to, to look at and mitigate. So um, well, thankfully it happened while we were all here and, and uh, we were able to get on it right away. But, um, but that's something that um, we'll continue to, to be looking at and monitoring. Um, we have a little bit of projects coming up that we'll be working on, but we'll be working around the community center to, to level the patio and uh, repair some things um, and, and update some landscaping around the tennis courts. Um, but I'll stop there and not get too long-winded. Are there any questions? Um, maybe not question, but comment. Given the erosion damage, um, I would advise, and I'm sure you, you have it on your radar, to uh, really develop a proactive plan to deal with the erosion issue around the pool, given the fact that it's such a um, pricey um, infrastructure, a piece of infrastructure we have, and also a source of, um, you know, revenue for us and, and fun for the community. So um, it would be critical to save the uh, property around the pool. And um, I know we'll have to redo the thought pool eventually because of the zero entry issue. Um, so as soon as we touch the deck, 
will have to you know bite the bullet and and um, and redo the thought pool but um, yeah I think um, preserving this area is critical absolutely and fully agree and um, we have we have worked with some of the members of uh, the straw program and getting some guidance on on plantings that can be done in the area to shore up the creek as well as being to look at um, some other agencies and you know forming a group that we can kind of continue to to look at possible repairs and and you know whatever we need to mitigate uh, further erosion there so but i fully agree i i have a quick question it's sort of an off the wall question but i mean every time we lose a part of the creek um cliff or whatever you want to call it creek bed um that perimeter becomes the new you know edge of the creek is there any possibility of moving back and starting to do some sort of kerosene situation to protect the pool um, without getting into the whole um, you know compliance issues with what you can do next to a creek I, I just it's pretty close to the edge isn't it right now um, yeah certain certain aspects of the facility are are dangerously close to the edge or, or a little too close for comfort. I don't think they were that close back when the facility was built. I just think we've, we've lost a lot of land over time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a tricky spot because of how close it is to the creek um, in terms of what can be done. And we'll, we'll need to explore those options. I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head in terms of um, any, in the means, anything that can be done that wouldn't involve, uh, you know, get, getting some permissions and bringing in some, right. some bodies. Yeah. You know? Now, this zero entry pool, is this going to sit in the same exact fo footprint as the existing pool? Oh, I would say definitely not. We, we, we would um, want to move um, the pool a much, much farther away from, from, the, uh, from the edge. Um, okay, that's what I was hoping to hear. Good. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on the board have any questions for Luke? I just wanted to commend you guys on an awesome summer season pool season especially to stephanie and you guys figuring out how to get the lap summers in there and being able to open it up for the water devils um i know that the kids who did manage to participate in that because it was a very limited program loved it um and being able to offer what you can is pretty amazing without any super spreader events so thank you guys Thank you and so we're making a little bit of money. Exactly. Absolutely. It was a, um, a wonderful summer given the circumstances. And the staff should be commended. I'm sure you passed that along already without having to be prompted. But wonderful job. And thank you so much for your leadership. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Uh, you bet. Anything else from the board? Sivan, do you have something? No, I was just pointing towards the attendees public thing, which you can't see. So there's no point of me doing any hand motions. Sorry. Oh, oh I, um, I see that there's somebody from the public that would like to speak. And I guess we're ready for them. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi. Um, thanks for the report, Luke. Um, I guess I'll just go down in the same order that you um, have uh, presented your information. Um, first of all, thanks uh, for doing what you could do this summer. I think it was important to many people. Unfortunately, it was too expensive for my blood. I didn't get to swim this summer, but that's okay. I took up walking. So, um, But uh, hopefully we'll get on track next year. I certainly think we should be able to do that. Um, and cons uh, but uh, thank you very much for what you did. Um, as far as the uh, uh, park maintenance um, facility, I, I I spoke to you, I spoke to Eric, and I, I guess I want to speak to the board now. I'm really concerned about access um, to our complete park uh, during the construction and demolition phase. I'd like to see at least a wheelchairs with access uh, path, uh, which I guess would be about six feet, 
to circumvent, uh, to connect our park so we can walk in our park. Um, as I pointed out, you really, you cannot, you're not welcome to walk on um, uh, Miller Creek uh, uh, schoolyard during the day. And so if, if it, the plan is to just simply make that area inaccessible, that's really gonna impact uh, a lot of users of the park. Um, I know there's safety concerns, but I think uh, I think they you can do it with proper planning and 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 proper will, and it's very very important. Um, you know, once again, I I, I I bring this up, and Linda's brought it up for for the last several years, I guess, and that is uh, the access uh, to the park, uh, that steep access that needs to be graded. It's a very small project. I don't know what the resistance is on your part. Maybe you have to be sued. Maybe the, the district has to be sued uh, for, you know, a disability type uh, action. I don't know. But I'm pretty ticked off that you guys, you know, give it lip service that you want to, to improve the park. And, and you really do ignore a, a large section of the, of the public. Um, so there's that issue now as far as the pool is concerned that's a big capital expense which um i have heard that we're having a la nina this year we're actually in rainy season now but uh, we may lose a lot more of land this winter and i would recommend that uh you look if you if you're not doing it now look for measures that can protect that that uh, hillside during a, a very wet winter because that's what we may be facing um, it's unfortunate that uh, this problem that we've known about for years uh, isn't part of the planning process but uh, apparently the board has uh, other priorities um, so I I guess we may get caught with our pants down here, and uh, that would be very unfortunate. So let's plan ahead. Okay, thank you, Stephen. All the members of the public. Okay. Luke, anything else to add? Nope, that's it. Luke, thank you very much for your report and all the work this summer and beyond. Thank you. Okay, next Park and Rec Commission meeting, um, November 24th. Board member items of interest or requests for future agenda items. Anybody have anything? Uh, Bill or Saban, anything? <laughs> Not at this time. Okay. Just an update on what kind of measures we can do to shore up the creek bed and everything so that we don't lose any pool. Sure. Yeah, I think that has everyone's attention. It's interesting. Um, when we had the erosion next to the pool house, um, how far did all of the, um, how far off the creek? They look. Um, did they just looking back at a pool house, or did they go up where the top pool was and make any recommendations then? Or did at that them? point in time, we had them <clears throat> come in to do boring samples, and they wow. did the samples at that area where the hill was receding slightly, uh, and they pulled back a little bit and actually discovered pretty solid bedrock at not too deep of an area. And if you recall, a few years ago, we you know proposed that. Uh, a full length Greek study that was not uh, approved to be included in the budget that would have been done by a woman named Rachel Kamen, who is a hydrologist, uh, who, uh, you know, works for a firm that knows a lot about these types of things. Um, so to answer your question, no, they didn't look farther up. They looked at the area of concern at that point in time and made some recommendations, but also didn't have any recommendations or 
didn't feel uh, you know things like retaining walls or piers or anything like that were needed at that time due to the boring sample showing a significant bedrock got it okay all right understood so looking at our entire pool facility um vis-a-vis -vis the creek bed um certainly should be in our future I appreciate all the efforts uh that have gone by so far but there's some more to work to do obviously <clears throat> okay um i would just reiterate jeff before you move on on this um uh, again uh with you especially outgoing bill shea uh, we'll assume the presidency when your term is officially over. And then just to be very clear, uh, um, the outgoing board members' terms don't actually end until I believe it's either December 4th or December 5th. Even though this is your last regularly scheduled meeting, you're still on the board until uh, the 5th, uh, which is when the new boards will become effective and their first meeting will be on the 8th. On the 8th, okay. All right, and then um, <clears throat> at any point after that and uh, up until the beginning of next year, we all have some paperwork to do. Um, yeah, I'll follow up with all of that. You'll need to file leaving office form 700s, um, so yeah. on, but you don't, you don't need to do that until the beginning of the new year. Understood. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, so I guess that makes Bill Shea our president elect for the time being. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm not conceding. I got <laughs> well, and, but I'm going to require you wearing a mask from now on. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, members of the public, uh, items for future agendas. One second. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, yes. Uh, Bill and Savan, I'd like you to um, think, uh, assemble some discussion or uh, maybe even a group to look at uh, the future of our open space and park policy concerning open space. As I had keep saying, um, it is one of the greatest assets that we have in the community. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't get nearly the kind of attention that it does deserve. Um, that and also accessibility. Um, we can broaden the, um, the service to the public by, you know, finding out what older people want to do. And, you know, there's, I, I just feel like we're so focused on uh, school children um, that we really miss uh, the full uh, full community. So um, that's what I'd like. I'm, I'm requesting uh, op a discussion about open space. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. If there are no other items, um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so moved. Leah. Yeah, Lee on that one. He made it in there. Good for you. <laughs> All right. And sit up in a second. Uh, Tiffany, go ahead. I'm sorry, I missed the second. I'll second. I started yeah. to say, but I'll second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Green. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Very good, everyone. Thank you very much for your attendance. Um, Bill and Saban, good luck. Thank you. Wish you the best. And uh, give my best to your new board members. Um, Absolutely. I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll be checking in on occasion. We'll be in I expect you to attend at least once a month. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you all again. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, night. Jeff and Isabella and Leah, especially. Thank you, guys. It's been a real, it's been an honor. You bet. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. Good night. Good night.